I can go back to 1983 when my daughter was born in Oxford. Unfortunately, she was born 10 weeks premature and was very poorly and weighed little more than a bag of sugar. I was walking through the streets of Oxford one day, going to the John Ratcliffe Hospital, and who should I meet literally walking in the opposite direction but Rabbi Refson. I says to him, what are you doing here? He says, I was in London and I heard that you had a daughter, thank God, and that she needed a brocha, so I've come to give her a brocha. So we went to the hospital together and she was laying in the incubator. He put his hand on the incubator, he gave her the brocha. Within two minutes of him leaving the uh, intensive care unit, the nurses were already altering the, the oxygen supply. She no longer needed um, additional oxygen. 30 years later, 30 years later, Rabbi Refson and Mrs. Refson make Sheva Brockers for her. Indeed, Rabbi Refson was under the chuppah at her wedding. I was first met Diane Refson through a mutual friend of ours some 20, 30 years ago. I then was saying Kaddish for my late parents. On a number of occasions, Solly used to grab me and take me to the Shomri Das because Diane Refson had telephoned him to say they were short of a minion. It was a very warm gentleman who could relate to everybody and everything. When I met Baron Revson, his kindness, support and understanding had like a tremendous impact on me uh, and it meant that I, was, I felt very comfortable with my Judaism in ways that I hadn't done previously. I first met Diane Revson about 30 years ago when we came to Leeds and I met the Diane in, in the shore. It's in a ramshackle house in a state of disrepair, a little short with a mikvah below. But the Dayan made it an extremely welcoming, hospitable place, a beacon for Yiddishkeit in, in Leeds. He created there a very special atmosphere. Somehow he had the ability to reflect this feeling of happiness with everything that's going on in the world. He radiated this feeling. Sometimes on occasions uh, you will have there seven, eight, nine people, but it was very good. It was a good feeling. It was a pleasant feeling. On the Shabbos morning, you, they often didn't get the minion until quarter to 12, half past 11, quarter to 12. We'd be waiting for the 10th man to come. There would be five people davening. There would be um, three or four others messing around. And he would happily sit there, enjoying the company, learning, giving a sheer. That's where he was comfortable. He came from a working class background. His father was a garage owner in Sunderland. And so when he came to Leeds, he understood the average person in the street. He was always one of us. Hi come from a town in north of England called Sunderland, and that was the home of family Refson. So I remember a baby Refson, Zichroin of Rocha, and Avdan Mechaim Mechaim Reb David, and Marina Rabbi Yehuda Refson. Family Refson was a family of Torah and Chesed, uh, well known for that. Sunderland was a city of quarter of a million people. The Yidden started off at the very bottom, as did all Yidden. But very quickly, they all had businesses of their own, and the Yidden flourished there. Yehuda and I grew up in a wealthy home. Each of us had a horse of our own, and we used to ride the horse to Shul in the morning. And after which, my mother, Leah Shalom, used to take care of the horse for the rest of the day. My father, Zichrin Levracha, tells me a story when he was a young boy in yeshiva and he came he came over from the camps and he came to a yontif and he literally didn't have a suit for yontif and the rosh yeshiva said don't worry i'll arrange you to have clothes and apparently my father found out that it was a mr refson who had arranged him to have a new suit yehuda and i were different 
in almost every way. And you would have started to take a much greater interest in Chabad. And he went to Brunois. Brunois was the place in which he absolutely flourished. He was a, a mass smid. He was a person who took life very seriously. I do recall vividly when I was back and he was back, he was sitting in the Beis Medrash with a shtender in the corner, plowing through Shulchan Aruch. He did not let himself get distracted. He just sat there, gently humming, page after page. After four or five years there, he came to America. He went to 770. And the Rebbe certainly saw his talents. And he asked the Narol Arov to learn with him Shulchan Aruch. And my brother learned with him for years in the afternoon and remained very close to him. When my father Shalom was Nifta, the Rebbe thought that Yehuda should go and run the businesses in Sunderland. When I first came to Sunderland in 1976, I had nowhere to stay. I met a chap in Leeds and he said, look, uh, there's no problem. You can stay with, um, it was a kind of Chabad hostel. And I rang up, spoke to Mrs. Revson. I said, I'm coming to work in Sunderland. I'd very much like to stay with you. She said, oh, oh, okay. And when I got there, I was very mortified and very apologetic. I said, you must, be, you must think me very impudent inviting myself. I misunderstood the situation. So this was a private house I'd gone to. She said, look, now that you're here, you're gonna stay. And the first term was 13 weeks. People used to come to the Revson's house to have lessons in, in Hasidus. So I was learning, as these people came and uh, had their lessons, I was listening and I was learning quite a bit. And when I got to Sunderland, I really missed all the sport I'd done. Uh, so I said to Rebbe Huda, I've trained since I was 17 years old. I've never not trained. And I'm really feeling, uh, both mentally and physically, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not at my best. So Rebbe Huda said, we will train together. So we got a training routine. There was a field near his house. So I and he, we, we would run around the field a few times. And Avram Abela, who was four, he came along with us. During that time, he came to the notice of the Rabbonim in England, and he went to Leeds, where he was on the Besdin, and that was the beginning of his, I think it must have been almost 40 years in Leeds. Leeds is a, an Ashkenazi community coming from Russia, Poland. The community was very, very much a working class community not particularly observant. The phrase we used to use in these was middle of the road. People kept Shabbos, they kept Yontif, but to variable standards. There's always been Rabbonim in Leeds, of course, but it's Rabbi Refson's leadership of the Beis Din in the last 30 or so years that's made all the difference. Leeds is a big Yiddish shtot, and to be able to preside over that and to make sure kashrus is correct and shchita is correct and, uh, and a mikveh is correct, everything that's proper, that is a big chachma. He had passion for kashrus, to go with him to a shchita. It was a real experience. Wintertime, it's a long and nasty drive, and always he drove the car, and he was absolutely relaxed throughout all the way. Everything that he was doing as a Dayan, he loved it. I realized quite early on that the Dayan was a high-profile person who liked to keep a low profile. As an expert in, in halacha, he would be asked questions by people from all over the world, um, complex questions with, and, and which he would answer and which he would give advice on. And he never made a fuss about anything he did. It was always done quickly and quietly, as a true chosid does. As a person, he was an on-off. He was an on-off. He was not someone who shouted his virtues. He was uh, not someone who gave sort of shrill psokim and had his name everywhere. He was a person who worked on himself constantly to become less judgmental, to become more, more patient with people. And he would always looked to help people, the underdog, he would look to help them. And he set an example there for, for the other rebellion in Leeds and gave them backbone too. I remember when one of his sons was having his bris in Leeds. 
and the room was full of rebonim, dionim, and Robert Efson says to me, Davin for the Omid. I said, how can I Davin for the Omid? You're the um, Baal Simcha, it's your privilege to do so. Yes, it's my privilege, he says, but it's also your parents' yacht site. How can I Davin in front of all these rebonim and um, dionim, as I say, knackers? He says, don't be worried about that. You don't judge a person by their clothing. Once you take the hat and the coat off, underneath they're no different to your eye. Whenever he contacted me, Diane Refson always referred to himself as Yehuda, but I always called him Diane Refson. But at this meeting that I had to have at my office with Diane Refson and two gentlemen that were coming from out of town, they kept on calling him Julian, and it went on and on. And I was always calling him Diane Refson. But eventually, Diane Refson just looked at me with that smile of his and the twinkle in his eye as if to say, don't worry about it. He was really quite hilarious. One day I rang him up, I was quite concerned because I collect Russian dolls and they're displayed um, all round the front room on sort of display racks. And I started worrying and I said to him, I'm just a bit worried that, that with all these little faces staring at me, it's a bit like idolatry. Do you think it might be a bit of a vodazora? There was a little pause over the phone. He says, hmm, interesting. And then he said to me, well, do you prostrate yourself onto the carpet before them on a daily basis? And I said, no, absolutely not. And he said, well, I wouldn't worry too much about it. The real chokhmah in terms of him being a dayan and a senior rabbinic capacity was holding on to the values, but at the same time presenting it in a loving, appropriate way, whereby people accepted it. He, in a gentle way, managed to hold tight onto what was correct, proper, appropriate, and needed for the town. And by definition, therefore, for greater Anglo Jewry, he was able to hold tight onto that. Apart from his family, the school was the dearest thing to his heart. The school was set up by the Revsons around about 45 years ago under the, the guidance and the, and the bracha of the Rebbe. There are now many, many Rebbonim, Shluchim, leaders of communities and hundreds of families passionate about Yiddishkeit, living all over the world, who have their roots in Monero School. I grew up in Leeds um, and both the shul that I attended in Davendat and the school that I went to um, were under the leadership of Dain Refson, um, Allah Shalom, a blessed memory. The ethos of the school, it was to teach the children all they needed to know, all the skills they needed to know, to live in a, a totally observant, from life, but also, much more importantly, to fill them with, with a passion and a love of Yiddishkeit. Uniquely though for Rabbi Refson was his um, ability to empower and inspire us to do things. It was just a few weeks after my bar mitzvah, which was in August, and he said to me, you know, you should be reading the Megillah. Um, and that was my first Megillah reading um, that year. A lot of the skills in my role um, as a rabbi here in, in, in St. John's Wood came from those experiences early on. We can't talk about the school really without, uh, the dying in the school without joining the, his Rebbetson. Mrs. Rebbetson was and still is the, the headmistress of the school. Would deal with the relationships with the children in the school and the parents. The dying was the koyach behind the school. He was a fundraiser for the school. He was an excellent teacher in the school. He was even a fixer. We still have his screwdrivers and his drills still here, which he would then take out and use to fix the doors and anything else that needed doing. He was totally absorbed and, and almost obsessed with the school. Last year, around this, there was unfortunately a funeral for a boy who grew up in Leeds. And I had the honour and the privilege of driving Diane Refson, Mrs. Refson, from the Base Almond to central London. And at the time, um, Diane Refson was working on his beloved Menorah School, but a charity campaign. And when I was giving him the drive home, he, he opened up to me in a way that I'd, I'd, I'd never experienced before. He was m remembering the stories of, of 30 and 40 years ago of the school and telling me them, um, telling me about the children that came through. And he was opening up in a way which I, which I found very touching. And of course, it was literally the day before uh, when the campaign happened that, that unfortunately um, he passed away. 
We were so different. Our attitudes to everything was different. But I would have liked to have been more similar to him, and I know that I would have been a better person if I had been. Everything he told me, everything he shared with me, it was always with what's right in mind. Baruch Hashem, when I see his children, so I see that these middays are present there. He produced children who were proud to be shluchim. They saw their parents being Moisa Nefesh in a huge way, in a way which was very impressive and very demanding. And they saw that there was never any complaint, that this was the joy of making the contribution to Klal Yisrael. And this, this is Yehuda's legacy. The divine light can shine everywhere, but only in this world Hashem wishes to manifest His very essence. But in order to reach this level of achievement, to make the world a home for Hashem, man has to overcome negativity. And that is what the person in his development finds. The person has to overcome the evil in the world in order to perfect the world. Now, you would have thought that when Hashem created the world, He created it in a perfect state. But that is not the case. The world is not in a state of perfection. It was given to man in a state of imperfection that man has the task of tikkun ha'olam, of perfecting the world, of bringing the world to a state of complete goodness.